Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, I want to take you to the year 1991, when a fella named Rob was absolutely booking it to a grocery store in Missouri. See, Rob had been talking to his fiance, a woman named Angie. She had been using a payphone just outside of this grocery store, talking to Rob, and she had said on the phone that some strange man had been circling her in his car before the line went dead. As Rob was driving as fast as possible in his truck to get to her, he heard, from a car going in the opposite direction, someone scream his name. It was Angie. Before we get into it, please subscribe to see new stories for the dark every single week. Now, let's give it a go. So this story takes us to the town of Clinton, Missouri. A fairly small city by most standards, with less than 10,000 people living in that farming community. It sits near Truman Lake, a reservoir really, and the landscape can really vary around it, from flat plains in the north to marshy and hilly areas in the south. And in the year 1991, it was home to Angela Hammond, who at the time was 20 years of age. Now, I think most people would agree that life for our Angela was pretty sweet, and I think Angela would agree too. Angela was a popular, outgoing young person. She had a tight group of friends that had remained with her from high school and beyond. She was adored by pretty much everybody who knew her as Angie as she'd be flying around town in her Mustang. But in the quieter evenings, Angie would be with her fiance, 18-year-old Rob Schaefer, who was still in high school and was a star athlete on the football team. He had promised he would always take care of her and their baby. In 1991, Angie was pregnant. And so, with like the excitement of an upcoming wedding, an upcoming baby, Rob, he was preparing to enter the military once he finished with high school. Angie, she was taking classes at Central Missouri State University. She was happy. There wasn't nowhere else in the whole world Angie would rather be than right there. It wasn't the most exciting place in the world, but it was home. It had everything they needed, and it was safe. That was a dream, though, that would be shattered in April 1991. On the 4th of April 1991, the smell of summer was in the air, wafting in off the plains that surrounded the town. That's actually manure. Angie was four months pregnant at the time, eagerly awaiting September when she thought life would really begin. This was her last summer without her baby, without her husband. April 4th was a Thursday, and that, that day Angie was at a barbecue uh, with her friends Kyla, Marsha and Rob uh, at, a, at a place about 20 minutes outside of Clinton. It had been a chill day, nothing special, and she was designated driver for the day in her little Mustang. And so they were back in their hometown of Clinton by about 9 p.m. Looking for, just looking for stuff to do. Hint, uh, in Clinton, that list is very short. About an hour later, at 10 p.m., Angie had to drop Rob off at his house. See, Rob still lived with his mother and his younger brother, and his mother was heading off to work, so he would have to watch his younger brother for a couple of hours. But Angie, she was still with her friend, Kyla, and they were just driving around town, bumming around. I mean, they were in, you know, Angie's Mustang, so what else are you gonna do? Just drive it around, it's awesome. Angie said she would see Rob later that night when his mother got home from work. Though at around 11.15 p.m., Angie dropped Kyle off at her home, and by that stage, it's getting late, you know, Angie was yawning herself, thinking, you know, I might just hit the hay. Now, Angie did not have a phone in her house, and so to let Rob know, she'd have to use a payphone in town. The nearest one to her was just outside a food barn, a grocery store near the center of town. And so she pulled up her car into the parking lot thinking, this will only take a sec. The phone call began at precisely 11.23 p.m. and she was on the phone to Rob saying, hey, you know, I'm pretty tired, I, I'll, I'll see you later. I'm not gonna wait around tonight. But as she was on the phone to Rob, she got this like really ominous feeling that she was being watched. A pit began to form in her stomach as her eyes followed a Ford green pickup truck that was circling the block. It had circled multiple times. Now she couldn't see the driver in that truck, but she had the distinct feeling he was staring at her. Now Rob on the other end of the line, he wasn't too concerned. I mean, this guy was circling the block again and again and again, but you know, maybe he was looking into the parking lot, maybe he was looking at the grocery store, maybe he was just looking at the payphone. But Rob then sat up straight when she told him this pickup truck had pulled into the parking lot and parked his car right beside Angie's Mustang. Then a man 
got out and went to the payphone right beside the one she was using. Angie's voice became noticeably shaky as she described this guy to Rob saying he was dirty, scruffy looking, had long hair, glasses and was wearing overalls. He stood beside her at the other payphone for a few minutes but didn't use it and then he walked back to his pickup truck, pulled out a flashlight and started rummaging in the back of it. Now Rob was trying to calm Angie down at this point. He was saying, you know, maybe maybe he just needed to use the payphone. Maybe the one he'd went up to was broken and so he was waiting for her to, to finish up the call. So Rob told Angie, hey, ask him, does he need to use this payphone? Rob could hear on the phone this guy reply to her saying, no, he'd be back in a moment. Rob then, he changed the subject. But after talking for a few moments, Rob heard on the phone line a scream and then the phone hit the wall of the phone booth. He heard a man's voice say, I didn't need to use the phone anyway, and then the phone line was cut. Rob sat on the couch for a handful of seconds, just in shock, his mind racing at what he had just heard before he got up and he bolted for his own car, which was just outside. He just needed to get to the food barn as fast as possible. His mind was racing a million miles a minute. His knuckles were white against the steering wheel. The window opened as he was pushing the, the pedal as far as it would go. It was just like a handful of minutes to the grocery store. As he was racing there with just one objective to get to that payphone. However, as he was racing, a green pickup truck passed by him going the other direction. All Rob heard was a scream as he drove by, hearing someone scream, Robbie before the pickup was in his rearview mirror. Rob then immediately threw the car around, going in the direction the pickup had gone, breaking all the red lights in downtown Clinton. He began following this truck to the outskirts of town and it was getting bigger and bigger. But then, suddenly, it began getting smaller and smaller. Rob's car, it began to break down at that very moment. The transmission in his car was banjaxed. And he was helpless as the pickup continued on into the darkness on the edge of town, with red lights eventually disappearing into dust. He pulled his car over to the side of the road and began trying to flag down anybody he possibly could, begging them to, to follow, to follow that pickup truck. Now, eventually a woman did pull over, but she said, uh, no, she, re she refused. Instead, she took him to the police station. Angie had been kidnapped, and the police immediately went to the scene of the crime, the phone booth, but the only thing there was Angie's Mustang, and a phone hanging off the receiver. No other clues. Now the police, and in fact eventually the FBI, they found Rob's story to be just slightly unbelievable. Like, your transmission just happens to break down at that very moment? Come on. He was interrogated multiple times, but never changed his story just over the frustration and the terror of, of what he had witnessed of his fiance and his unborn child being being taken away. Now, Rob Schaefer was eventually removed uh, as a suspect. The, the transmission in his car was already faulty and then going at high speed and throwing it into reverse when he tried to flip around to, to chase the pickup. It's not, it's not good for your transmission, just so you know. Now, shortly after Angie was taken in a car and driven out of town, two witnesses would come forward and say they had seen a similar green, older model green Ford pickup in town in the days leading up. They were able to give police a pretty accurate description. A two-tone green pickup, late 60s, early 70s, with a decal at the back of a fish jumping out of water. Investigators immediately tracked down, you know, all the, the pickups in the state that, that matched this description but got nowhere. They, they searched, you know, from, from the plains of northern Missouri to the foothills of the Ozarks in the south, and they got nowhere. They couldn't find any leads as to where Angie was or, or who had taken her. Rewards of up to $10,000 were offered. Tips came in, but none solid enough. Alongside Rob Schaefer, Angela's ex-boyfriend, Bill Barker, was also questioned. There had been rumors going around that he was actually the father of Angela's baby, but that was never kind of really substantiated. In fact, those kind of rumors only came out after Angela was taken, as in, ooh, maybe it was this. People pulling shit out of their ass. And he, like Rob, was quickly excluded from the investigation. Another theory was known psychopath and all-round piece of shite, Kenneth McDuff. He was a serial killer active from the mid-60s to the early 90s, and he was known to be in Missouri at the time. He was also very well known for kidnapping, exactly what happened to Angela. 
Or how about Tommy Lynn Sells, another star, all-star serial killer. There's an entire episode of the That Chapter podcast about him. He too was in Missouri at the time and had a penchant for kidnapping and murdering women. Neither, however, were ever really seriously linked and both have since met their maker. A man called in saying he'd seen her in western Manitoba, in Canada. He was 100% sure he had seen her, but the police, you know, following up with that, putting up posters and flyers in that part of the province, revealed nothing. The police continued to request help from the public. Sure, they had jack shit to really go off of, or even if she was still alive. It had been an extremely terrifying incident, like the stuff of urban legends, and there was no clues left to go off of. They asked the public to check barns, abandoned houses, in, in case she was being held somewhere. But nothing came out. It was on April 19th, about two weeks after she had been taken, that the search started to die down. They didn't even know where to begin, and there was no end in sight. Police, though, continuing their investigation, began to theorize links to other cases in the area. This, this hadn't been the only kidnapping near convenience store in western Missouri, and... Even, even that year. Four years before Angela was kidnapped in Crystal City, Missouri, about four hours away, 18-year-old Diana Braungart was working as a cashier at a convenience store. She was seen leaving her job on the night of March 11th, 1987, saying she was, go home, she was going home to study for a, a high school exam she had the next day. However, she never made it to her car. She just vanished. When people went looking for her, her car was exactly where she had parked it in the parking lot, and there was no sign of her at home. The last witnesses to see her, they, they said they saw Diana in the car park, talking to a man, some unidentified man, and, and then she was never seen again. A sketch was made of that possible suspect, and when co-workers were shown this image, they said that had been her last customer before her shift ended. Then, on January 19th, 1991, four months before Angela was taken, in Max Creek, Camden County, which is about an hour 15 uh, due east of Clinton, 42-year-old Trudy Darby was closing up the convenience store she worked at at around 10 p.m. As she was closing up, she just glanced outside the window and she saw two men loitering near the store. And she, she was, she, she was got, getting a bad feeling about these two guys, so she called up her adult son to, to, to ask if he could come over to the store and help her close up and then maybe walk her to her car. He said he would be right over, he grabbed his keys, he hopped in his car and he, he drove over to, to Trudy's store which is only a, a handful of minutes away. He wanted to make sure his mom was safe. But when he arrived, it was eerily quiet. There was no one outside and the door to the store was unlocked. Trudy was nowhere to be found and the cash register was empty. He immediately reported this to the police who began searching for her and then Two days later, on a lonely gravel road, about 20 minutes from that store, blood and hair were found. The police arrived and began searching in that, in that area, and then in a river nearby, they found the naked body of Trudy. She had been shot twice in the back of the head. One month later, on the 27th of February, 1991, in the town of Nevada, Missouri, which is about an hour southwest of Clinton, 20-year-old Cheryl Ann Kennedy was, much like Trudy, closing up her convenience store for the night just after 10 p.m. She never called anyone, but she also never made it home. Her car was still sitting outside the store when the morning shift arrived. Now, the janitor who had been there, been there that night with her, he had left just a, a couple of minutes before Cheryl was due to close up, and he said when he was leaving, there was an unknown man still in the store. And then later on, two people, two separate people who just ha happened to be nearby at around 10, 15 p.m. said they had heard screaming that night. Cheryl Ann Kennedy has never been found. And of course, I gotta mention the infamous Springfield tree case. I, I covered that actually a while back. That's when Suzanne, Susie Streeter, Susie's best friend, Stacy McCall, and Susie's mother, Sherry Levitt, all three of them disappeared from Sherry Levitt's home in Springfield Missouri, once again not far from Clinton. And this was in June 1992, over a year after Angela was taken. Susie and Stacy had been celebrating their high school graduation, and Stacy was spending the night in Susie's home. The next morning, the house was found unlocked, with no sign of the three women who had been inside. 
Their cars were still parked out front, all their things were still there, clothes laid out, purses left on the floor. The dog was still there, although it was quite upset. The only clue was a broken porch light. When friends went into their home when they were looking for them, they reported some strange calls were made the morning of, and they remain a mystery, especially one message that had been left on an answering machine since erased. All these years later, there's theories and, and maybes, but the Springfield tree case remains unsolved. However, in 1994, Missouri State Police, they received a tip in relation to the Trudy Darby case. A man named Jesse Rush had told people that he and his half-brother had been involved in a murder. They had told numerous people about this. So, Jess Rush and his half-brother Marvin Cheney were both arrested and charged with kidnapping and first-degree murder. Now, he also made disturbing references to other women they had kidnapped and murdered. But who these were, they've never said. In one letter Jesse Rush wrote, he said if authorities knew everything they had done and all the other women they had killed, they would both be on death row. Instead, both received life in prison. Now, neither have any strong links to the other cases, the cases of Diana, Cheryl, or Angela, though Jesse Rush did match the description of the last person Diana had served at the store. But with what they did to Trudy and the other cases are so similar, and th those like vague, disturbing references they made, it seems likely there could be more victims out there, and they've always been seen as the strongest uh, persons of interest suspects in this case, in these cases. Jess Rush, by the way, released. He's out and about, maybe in a town near you. See, he was indeed sentenced to life without parole for the horrific stuff he had been proven to have done in the Trudy Darby case. And also, I mean, for the terrifying things he hinted at doing in those many letters he'd written from prison. Rush, 15 years old at the time, and his older half-brother, Marvin Cheney, were charged with the crime. KY3 covered Rush's trial in 1996. Evidence showed Rush had admitted to other people about being involved. But in 2012, the Supreme Court ruled that mandatory life without parole sentenced for children 17 or younger, that was unconstitutional. Jess Rush was released in September 2022. Because he was a minor at the time and the new Supreme Court ruling this Thursday, the bars separating Rush from the rest of the world will be open. Going back to Angela Hammond, though, who still, after she was kidnapped and driven away that night, nothing has ever been found, the most recent theory only came out a couple of years ago, and it seems like it could be the strongest about what could have happened to her. Tonight, detectives are hoping an old piece of evidence can generate new leads in a cold case. 30 years ago, a young woman vanished in Clinton, Missouri. Someone kidnapped Angela Hammond April 4th, 1991. It changed what our community was like when this happened. Nothing had happened like this before. It would be difficult for one single person to pull this off. Police believe that the abduction was planned. It's like something you, you can't let go of because someone here needs an answer. In 2021, on the 30 year anniversary of Angie's kidnapping, the Clinton Police Department released a letter that seems straight out of a movie. I mean, this whole story seems straight out of a movie, but check this out, right? Get this. A confidential informant who was working with the Clinton police to help take down this big drugs ring received this letter on April 4th, 1991, the very same day Angie was taken. Had been involved in a case where he was a confidential informant, and this was a pretty significant narcotics case that probably disrupted some pretty significant drug business. Now, police never said they had this letter until very, very recently. The informant received this letter at home and it even had his confidential number on it, which only the police, you know, should know. So whoever sent this letter knew he was an informant and it seems like they probably had someone inside the police who was telling them this. The letter goes like this. Hello, number blank, that's his confidential number. We know who you are, number blank. People like you deserve what you get. We know where your foxy daughter is at. She will see us soon. Tell, name redacted, she has our deepest sympathy in her further loss. Goodbye. So this letter was probably sent from someone in this narcotics ring who knew they were a confidential informant, right? Well, it just so happens 
as he said in the letter, the confidential informant had a daughter. The daughter was named Angela. The police believe this kidnapper got the wrong woman. And so ends the story of Angela Hammond. She is still missing to this very day. This is what she would look like today if she is still alive. That we may never know. There's a million different theories about what could have happened to, to, to Angela, you know, whether it be a case of mistaken identity, serial killer, a random crime of opportunity, whatever. This stage, her family just want her body back. And whoever did this is still out there. And so, Shanae, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really appreciate you being here watching this whole video. Um, please check out the That Chapter Instagram, the That Chapter Patreon, and Please be sure, if you're looking for more stories that have more of a dark history twist or paranormal twist, uh, please check out the That Chapter podcast, which is available on all platforms. So give it a goo. But until the next video, which will be out in a couple of days, please take care of each other. Please take care of yourselves. Because I love you. Mike out.